on camera. Today is Monday, May 23rd, 2016, and my name is Tony Hilliard. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Peggy Hilliard, another volunteer, and Sue Verhoff, the senior archivist here at the center. We are, we are here today to record the oral history of Mr. Jack Craven, who served in the United States Coast Guard during World War II. Mr. Craven's oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. We're honored to have you here with us today, Mr. Craven, and we thank you for participating in the pro uh, project. You're quite welcome. Would you begin by telling us your full name and where you live? My name is John Craven, and I live in Noonan, Georgia. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your early life. My early life, I'm a second generation American. Both of my people were born in Ireland and they came into the port of Philadelphia under the quota system that the Immigration Service had at that time. They met in Philadelphia and married and we lived in West Philadelphia. Uh, we lived in a house that was probably built in the 1870s, no electricity, no central heat, and it wasn't until our early years of elementary school that my parents could afford to put central heat and electricity in our home. I went to a parochial school in West Philadelphia uh, with no indoor plumbing, and um, it was run by the Sisters of St. Joseph. And after graduating from the eighth grade, I went to St. Thomas More High School run by the Archdiocesan priests, who were very great. They, ha they taught with great love, and uh, you had to persevere. Otherwise, you, you didn't stay in St. Thomas More. <laughs> and uh, after graduating from St. Thomas More, uh, I worked, uh, uh, during my years at St. Thomas More, I worked for the Evening Bulletin I had a paper route, and um, in my later years, I was a branch manager. I distributed the papers to carriers and deposited the money. And uh, uh, after uh, the, world, the war broke out, I enlisted in the U.S. Coast Guard uh, and uh, served uh, until 1945 honorably. What year did you graduate from high school? 1942. Okay. Okay. And then you, you worked at the Bulletin? And yes, I worked enlisted. at the Evening Bulletin, which is now out of business. Is there, what, what interested you in the Coast Guard? Well, um, uh, I wanted to join the Air Force, but at the time they had restrictions as far as height was concerned. And a, a gentleman I went to school with, um, uh, a young fellow I went to school with uh, and had buddied with all my life. He was interested in the Coast Guard, so we both enlisted in the Coast Guard. And we went to um, Jamaica Beach for our boot camp. Is that in New York? In New York. And uh, Frank Monahan, uh, he wound up in, on a DE from New York to Murmansk, Russia. I had easier duty. Uh, I was assigned uh, uh, to uh, the uh, area of uh, South Jersey for about a year. Then I was transferred uh, to the West Coast where I um, uh, boarded the cruiser Indianapolis to Pearl Harbor to patrol the Hawaii's after Pearl Harbor. And on the way to Pearl Harbor, uh, it was uh, speculated that a Jap sub was following us and I, as a passenger uh, at, with a group of uh, submarine recruits from New Haven. We went topside and as I was squeezing through the hatch, 
that big artillery went off over my head and blew my ears out. And that was the only real activity I had seen during the war. But it was a very interesting uh, situation. I served in the Hawaii's until my father passed away. And then the Red Cross called me and I came back to Philadelphia and was assigned to the 4th Naval District. Okay. And from June uh, 44 till I was discharged in September of 45. And at that time, my brother was also uh, 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 was also uh, recruited from uh, was also uh, 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 he also came back from southern France. He was on a minesweeper during the Second World so War. So he was in the Navy. He was in the Navy. I had a young our youngest brother was also in the Navy. Uh, we sold, uh, we, we served a cumulative total of almost 10 years in the Second World War as enlistees. Okay. And it was very rewarding. It was good for our uh, ability to cope with life later on as for discipline and whatnot. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, if we, if, we uh, if the same situation prevailed today, all the uh, drill instructors would be in jail. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it, it served a purpose. When, uh, when, you, when you did your initial uh, post uh, boot camp service, you, you stayed in the, in the 4th District area? No, I, I was in, yes, I was in there for, in the 4th Naval District for a year. What did they have you doing? Well, I, we were patrolling uh, air sea rescue off the off the Jersey coast, and uh, uh, it uh, it was it, it it was kind of boring, but uh, it was part of my duties. We I've read about situations where they had blackouts along the East Coast. Did you experience any of that? Did you? Uh, yes. Uh, my, uh, as a matter of fact, prior to our being in the service, my brother was an air raid warden in Philadelphia, and he had to patrol a certain geographic area to make sure that the people put their lights out uh, during the blackouts. And um, but I did, I didn't, uh, I didn't have that same experience that he did. Did you, were you operating out of Cape May? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, out of Cape May, New Jersey. Okay, mm -hmm. so what was a typical day like for you at that point in your life? Well, we, um, we would patrol the area off the uh, inland waterways and off the coast of uh, New Jersey. What kind of a ship were you on? It was, uh, it was a Chris Craft. It was a Chris Craft, it was a donated by uh, someone who was probably our chief petty officer. As a matter of fact, his name was Turk Duncan. And he was a, a wrestling promoter in Wildwood, New Jersey, and also Philadelphia. Uh, when you said Wildwood, it just brought back some memories. But the, um, so you you thought that was kind of boring? Did you ever have any warnings of something? Well, I, or... I applied for sea duty then. And then that's when they shipped me to the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And what did you board on the West Coast? Well, I, I was at Treasure Island uh, for probably uh, a month or so. And then we boarded the cruiser Indianapolis, supposedly to catch a ship in Pearl Harbor. But we wound up patrolling the Hawaii's. So you were on the Indianapolis just for the transit? Just, yes, as, a, as a, I was a passenger. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you got to, to Pearl Harbor, what did you think of Pearl Harbor? Well, it, it, it was amazing to see the destruction that the Japanese had created at Fort Island and the Pearl Harbor in that area and the ships that were sunk in the, in the harbor of, uh, uh, at Pearl Harbor. After you would arrive and got settled in, what was your assignment? Well, uh, we patrolled the uh, Hawaii's 
uh, and uh, it was rather uh, a somewhat uh, interesting job because I did get to see all the Hawaiian Islands, uh, Molokai, the Leper Island, where, where Father Damien was the uh, leper priest, and uh, it was very interesting. What kind of a, a ship were you on? It was an SC, and, and, but I also did beach patrol. Mm -hmm. okay. What's uh, an SC? It, it was an, uh, an escort vessel. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see enemy, any... Uh, no, I never saw enemy, enemy action. The only activity I saw was on the way to Pearl Harbor on the cruise for Indianapolis, which was later sunk in the Philippine Sea after delivering the components for the atomic bomb. Did you like Pearl Harbor? Yes, I thought it was very interesting. Yes, it was, there's a lot of history and Ford Island was very interesting. When you would go out and do your patrols through the through the islands, how what would you would you be gone several days or several weeks? Or? Uh, no, it was probably we would go into port the different ports in the various islands, and uh, so it wasn't uh, we weren't at sea for okay. any duration. How how large was the crew on the vessel? Uh, we probably had about ten on the okay. crew. It wasn't that big a ship. Was the food good? Pardon me? Was the food good? The food? Yes, oh, the food was, it was edible. <laughs> it was edible. <laughs> but it was probably better than the army in the Marine Corps had. <laughs> was there any time, or did you have to stand alerts, or was there any time uh, the command got excited about anything? No. Okay. No. Mm -hmm. Did you get did you get much information about what was happening in the other parts of the Pacific or even the Atlantic during uh, the war? No, everything. Uh, uh, President Roosevelt had censorship, okay. and uh, uh, there was very little information that we had. I mean, there was maybe general information after an island was invaded. But that was about the only information we got. So did you get your information from the news, from the media, from, from the papers, news, yes. things like mm -hmm. that? Yeah, okay. Um, what do you remember most? Pardon me? What do you remember most? Well, I remember the training that we received, which really benefited me later in life, and uh, the discipline, and... Uh, Harsh at times, but uh, it was a good uh, a memory building situation for me. So, how long did you were you operating out of Pearl Harbor? How long were you there? Um, I would say probably a year. I would imagine a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I lose conception of time, and the older I get, the more. <laughs> Where conception I lose. So, were you there when the war ended? Uh, no, I was in Philadelphia. Okay. I was in the Fourth Naval District okay. when the war ended. Well, what was the reaction when you heard the news? Well, it was. It, I, we. I thank the Lord that it was the war to end wars, which unfortunately it yeah. wasn't. And uh, I, 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 I think our political system let a lot of situations go by the boards, which could have been resolved right then and there, because my friend who was on a merman's run, I saw him in, in 44, and he said, Jack, we should fight the Russians right now. He said they wouldn't let us off the ship, and he said, uh, or USA to USSR Lindley's was painted all, painted off the barrels before it left the ship. And he said, we weren't allowed off the ship. We had to stay aboard ship during the time we were in, in Murmansk. So he told you that in 1944? Four, yes. Yeah. Yes. And he was right. Yeah. <laughs> so did you stay in the Coast Guard for much longer? No, as soon as the war, I, do, I had 41 points, which was just sufficient to get out. The war was over in August. And I was out the following month, 
And they said, if you stay in, we'll give you this grade. And I said, no, I want that piece of paper. <laughs> so I felt that there was more things to do in life than be in the military. So you stayed in the, in the area, in the Philadelphia area? Oh, yes. I stayed in Philadelphia. As a matter of fact, I went to work for Armour and Company, okay. yeah. and they sent me to Rutgers University. I wasn't a student at Rutgers, but I did extension work there in uh, poultry and ag products, marketing and grading, and I went back to Armour, and I worked for Armour for uh, several years. Then I went with an independent outfit as manager and salesperson. And I stayed there for uh, probably for 18 years in industry, and then went with the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1964 uh, in charge of the Federal State Poultry Market News Service in Columbus, Ohio, uh, which entailed uh, uh, the area of Columbus in uh, the southern part of Indiana. It was very rewarding. So all this time is in the Philadelphia area, with the exception of what you just said. Go Pardon on. me? So most of the time you lived in the Philadelphia area and then moved to Indiana? I know. I moved to Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I was uh, in 1964. Uh, we, I could see what was happening to the business uh, between the city tax fathers, the county, um, and the state. Uh, Whatever one adopted as a tax situation, the others adopted. And it got to the point where it was difficult for small businesses to survive. And I worked on a commission basis and a salary. So my, my last years there was the poorest uh, bonus I got. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture had asked me to, if I would be interested in going to Columbus, Ohio. So did you have to go to any government training before you took that job? Oh, no, except for uh, the training I had at Rutgers University. Okay. And, and not as a student. I, did, I was there uh, on extension work. And uh, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, the dean of the poultry science department said to me, he said, Jack, he said, you should stay here. You had the GI Bill of Rights. And I said, I promised Armour I would go back, so I don't want to go back on my word. And uh, I couldn't do today uh, what I did then without a degree because uh, my peers, we had 22 offices across the country, and I was the only one without a degree. And I was very fortunate. The industry was very uh, cooperative. Uh, I was one of the only uh, offices that was uh, awarded uh, Serviceman of the Year Award in 1975 because of the exceptional service that I gave to the industry. And I had that experience because I had been in industry and I knew what industry needed. So. Well, when you worked for Armour, what specifically did you do? I was in sales and, okay. uh, and poultry, eggs, and provisions. And uh, we would work on the floor in the mornings. And then we had a geographic area of Philadelphia that I had to, uh, that I had to uh, uh, visit and try to make sales. And that was mostly South Philadelphia. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which was very good because the mortgages weren't real heavy and people ate before they paid their mortgage. <laughs> so, <laughs> when, when, after the war was over, did it, was there, I know there were a lot of folks coming back home. Was it, uh, you were fortunate that you got a job fairly quickly. What about the rest of the folks? Well, it was very difficult because you had to transition between military uh, a military industrial complex that hadn't been, the, the consumer markets had been neglected and they hadn't gotten to the point where we got back into, into consumer manufacturing and jobs were extremely tough to get. So I was very fortunate to get a job. When you went to Columbus, what was, what was, 
What was your job there? I was officer in charge of the Federal State Market News Service okay. in Columbus, Ohio. And the only disadvantage there, I was the only federal person in a state facility. So that was never <laughs> too good. But industry was so rewarding that it offset the problems I had with uh, the politicians in Columbus, and every year she had a, every four years she had a different group of, of politicos come in, uh, and they uh, thought I was political, which I wasn't. I was there, I was professional in agriculture. And you went from there to Indiana. Well, I, we, I, we, worked, we worked very closely with Ohio State University Ohio State. Okay. and Purdue University, and, uh, which was the uh, Department of Agriculture. So we uh, had contacts in all over the area. So was, was your job at that point inspection? Or? No, my job, uh, <clears throat> my job consisted, uh, it was a time element. Uh, and it consisted of uh, speaking to uh, 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 production people, uh, feed market people, marketing people, and then getting prices on various poultry and egg products. And I had to release those to the uh, Associated Press, Reuters, and I had uh, one radio broadcast a day and we had various newspapers that would call us for information. So the, the farmers and, and the, the, the people who raised the livestock were really looking? Yes, they, they looked for, well, of course, market news was a result of um, the early days when we had commission merchants uh, and the farmers would bring their product to the market and the commission markets, the commission uh, merchants would uh, sell it for a commission. But then the commission merchants took advantage of the farmers, and then the Pacman Act was enacted, which uh, inaugurated poultry market news, grain market news, cattle market news, uh, and and uh, that was a. a, a, a uh, it was a guidepost for the, uh, the industry. So then you went to Indiana. You went to Indiana after uh, after that. Well, yes. Now everything uh, everything is agribusiness today, uh, where you're totally integrated. Uh, you have your feed operation, your production, and your marketing is all in one phase. And what I did years ago is available by pushing a button on a computer today and all that information is available. So my job would be obsolete today. So, Do you ever, when you left the service, when you left the Coast Guard, did, did you uh, ever get together with any of the folks you served with? Uh, yes, I did. Yes, I, I, I uh, uh, did uh, get, uh, uh, we had a fellow from, uh, who I thought was really, he was a school principal on Bar Harbor, Maine, and I thought, well, gee, this is really great. <laughs> and I also didn't realize it was a one-room school, and he was also the janitor <laughs> and the gardener. And we got together with him on occasion. We had another gentleman, Click Gehring. He was in Linden, New Jersey, and occasionally we'd get together with him. But, These uh, were all people who were on part of the crew of the, well, the vessel. Well, uh, basically, some of the crew and some in boot camp from boot okay. camp. Mm -hmm. And of course, my friend, uh, who uh, was on the merman's front, I was always very friendly with him. He was a very, a very good friend of mine. Okay, um, is what. What was your view of the way of the way the country was going during the war? I mean, uh, oh, I thought that um, I, I thought that we were a salvation of of Western culture, and uh, I really felt that uh, 
we were doing a job as, as solving a lot of the world's problems. Little as I realize, um, uh, Stalin <laughs> was out to control all of Europe if he possibly could. And uh, it was interesting to see the competition between Hay and Roosevelt, you know, uh, uh, Churchill uh, wanted to be on Stalin's side so he could get his part of Europe and uh, Roosevelt uh, uh, kind of pushed Churchill out of the way and he wanted to dictate what was happening but it never really worked out. When you were, you spent a lot of time in the Pearl Harbor area, what was Pearl Harbor like during the Second World War? I mean, we see movies and there are tons of sailors running around. Oh, it, uh, it was very restricted and um, uh, it, it was interesting. Uh, the interesting part of the service was that um, Growing up, you lived in a certain geographic area and you weren't exposed to different areas of the country, whereas you got to meet people from various places and different cultures, and it was a very interesting, a rewarding. Uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it was kind of a, a, a situation where it was a life-learning situation. It was an adventure. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, tell us a little bit about your your personal life. Did you get married? Oh, I got married uh, to a young lady uh, who was a single uh, uh, child, and she didn't know what the knobs on the stove were for, but she turned <laughs> out to be an excellent cook, an excellent mother, and a soulmate that couldn't be replaced. And we were married. Uh, two months short of 66 years. She passed away three years ago, and it's a vacuum that can never be filled. Where Where were you married? In Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, yes. okay. Mm -hmm. And then she just went with you when you started moving yes. west? Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Do you have children? Yes, I have three children. I have a, a they're, they're all uh, practically raised in Ohio, and uh, they all went to Ohio State. My son graduated in journalism, and he's in advertising in Chicago, and he's ready to retire. Uh, he's a partner in Upshot, which is marketing and advertising. Uh, my uh, daughter is married to the uh, um, previous uh, CEO of Panera Bread. He has 27 uh, units in uh, 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 Virginia, uh, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Arkansas, and he expects to open three more units in in in, in Virginia before the year is out. Uh, my daughter uh, teaches preschool here at Holy Trinity. Her her husband is a CPA. They have five children. So I have nine, nine grandchildren and ten great-grandchildren. <laughs> so. Do you get to see them much? Oh, I do. As a matter of fact, I was there yesterday. Okay. And, and perhaps that might be one of the advantages of hearing aids. My grandchildren and some of my great-grandchildren were there. And so I just pulled the earplug. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great. You know, the uh, two of the youngest uh, great-grandchildren are just about two years of age each, and it's wonderful to be able to live to see them progress in life. So I have a lot to be thankful for. Yeah. Um, Toward the end of the interview, we like to give the veteran an opportunity, as I mentioned to you earlier, to editorialize just your your comments, your perspective on whatever topic you'd like to talk about. Well, I, I think that um, uh, the country has been politically correct to minority situations in, in this country who should do the same 
as my parents did when they came to this country. They should persevere and get out and preserve their dignity and rather than be wards of the state. And I think that uh, uh, I like what Trump says and I feel that, uh, that I'll vote for him because I feel that uh, he, ha he may have the uh, solutions. Each of the political parties, we elect people at every level, whether it's the city, the state, county, or federal, and their first obligation is to their party, and the mm -hmm. constituents are secondary. And I think that that's the problem that's created the problems we have in this country today. People aren't and, doing their jobs. And I, there's no bigger business than the United States government, whether it's nationally or internationally, and it should be run like a business. It's been abused, and there's so much fraud that it's unbelievable. Uh, working for the government in a mid-management mid position, I could see how the bureaucracy operates. Uh, they uh, once money is allocated, uh, a bureaucracy is established. And that bureaucracy does everything in our power to exist. And they'll come up with programs that are frivolous, that have no meaning for the job that they're supposed to do to obtain, maintain a budget. And there's no accountability. And the people that are appropriating the budgets I have no accountability. They should have accountability where that dollar bill goes. And I feel that maybe Trump can solve those problems. Okay. How long have you lived here? How long have I lived here? I've lived here for uh, probably 15 years. Okay. We lived in Florida for 13 after our children got out of Ohio State. And um, then we had health problems, uh, so it was either moving here, Washington, D.C., or Chicago. So this was the more favorable climate, and it was the best climate, and it was a great place to live. When did you retire? I retired in 1986. Okay. And the reason I retired was because I had, in, I, I was 62 years of age, I had inadequate help, and uh, the pressures from the politicians were such that I just decided to call it quits. I was having hypertension and blood pressure problems, and I felt, well, if I don't get out, they'll carry me out. So you've enjoyed retirement? Well, I was apprehensive about retiring, but after I retired, uh, I thought it was great because uh, it's a different phase of life and uh, it's enjoyable. Well, good. Did you have any questions? I do have a question for you, Mr. Craven. We don't have a lot of Coast Guard accounts in our collection. We don't have a lot of Coast Guard veterans. Can you just tell me a little bit about your job on the ships? What, what a typical day was like for you? Well, it was just maintaining the operation of the ship. I, I don't know how, how else to explain it. And um, it was something that I wouldn't want to do in civilian life. And when the war was over, I was glad to receive that honorable discharge. <laughs> so. What was your job? What did they call you? What it was, was Seaman you? First Class. Seaman mm -hmm. First Class. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were going to send me to Signalman School, which was blinker lights and flags. Mm -hmm. But then I, uh, I got I got out of the service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Okay. Well, that was a good story. Mm -hmm. we, we want to thank you for participating in the program, and thank you for your service. Oh, you're quite welcome. It was a privilege to serve this country. Okay. I, I I really feel that. Um, military service should be mandatory, particularly for the males. I'm, I'm not sure about uh, females being subject to combat duty. I don't believe in that, and uh, I don't think they should be subject to that. Okay. 
Uh, a lot of people agree with you. So, uh, uh, yeah, mostly in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you want to... Well, thank you so uh, much. You're quite welcome. Now, do you want anything of my brother's? Did you want to talk about your brother? Well, my brother was on a minesweeper. My, my dad was very mechanical, and during the Depression, he couldn't get a job because of the economic situation. And um, when the war broke out, my, my mother wanted my brother to get a, a Catholic high school education. And I said, Mom, you should let him go to trade school because that's where he's, he's adapted to trade. Mm -hmm. So he just skipped school and he, he went to work for Hoover Company repairing vacuum cleaners. <laughs> and then when the war broke out, uh, he was 16 and he registered for the draft. And I, I can still picture my mother going down to the draft board with her Irish brogue <laughs> and his birth certificate <laughs> trying to tell them that he wasn't eligible to go to the service. But when he was 17, they finally okay. allowed him to join the Navy. And he went and through boot camp. I, he was the first recruit out of... Uh, uh, out of uh, uh, the Bethesda, Maryland, okay. and um, they sent him to Motor Machinist Mate School in Norfolk, Virginia, and, uh, and immediately after his term was over, they, they put him aboard a minesweeper, and he went to Bessert, North Africa. Okay. And uh, from North <coughs> Africa, I guess they assembled the invasion fleet for Sicily, and they were in the lead. They would go in and clear the minefields so the destroyers and the cruisers could bombard the fields. And uh, uh, the ship in front of them was sunk. He was almost rammed by a German Messerschmitt. He said it was about 20 feet off the bow. And he, and he said it was like heaven and earth pulling him off this earth. And, and uh, uh, he had quite ex quite an experience, and uh, it was just just a shame to see him go because he and I were so close during our lifetime. He he survived the war, didn't he? He survived the war, but he was killed in Philadelphia oh. two weeks after he came home oh. for my after my father's funeral. Oh, no. So oh. so uh, you sound like you miss him. Pardon me? It sounds like you miss him. Oh, I do. It's very emotional when I think of it. It's been. It's hard. It's very hard. Do you want him to stop for a minute? Yeah. Okay. Can you hold up your discharge paper so we can get that on the record and we can see it? <coughs> Honorable Discharge, United States Coast Guard. And that patch at the bottom, what is that? That's a ruptured duck. <laughs> what they, they, gave us, <laughs> they gave us that on our uniform when we graduated, when we uh, were discharged. We, were to, we had to sew that on our uniform. And uh, it was a symbol of uh, your service okay. during the Second World War. Okay. So, but it wasn't part of the discharge. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for participating oh, in the program. You're, you're quite welcome. And thank you for your service. Oh, you're quite welcome. Thank you for your service, <laughs> because you were in a political war. <laughs> and, and.